Cool. Thanks, Kirkby. I think everybody knows me by now. You know everybody. Roy, Lucid, awesome. Um, uh, this is my first mind garden, and uh, I understand that um, you can present on anything as geeky as you want was the criteria I was given. So maybe next time I will go significantly more geeky than this. Um, but at, at any rate, I thought it would be helpful for us to talk a little bit about design systems because um, we're kind of hot on that topic right now, um, building up our, me, the first UX designer and building up a UX team um, and trying to figure out how we standardize design across platforms. So um, the, the first question I'll address is what a design system is. Has anyone here worked at an organization or on a team previously where they had a design system? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if Paul raised his hand, but um, a, uh, it, or has anybody here worked with um, like Apple human interface guidelines or material design? That's a form of a design system or bootstrap or choose your favorite implementation framework of the day. Um, that is another form of design system. So. Um, it, it sounds like most people have probably bumped up against these at some point doing front-end development. Um, here is a very sage and important quote that says, an agreed upon collection of principles, guidelines, and patterns that govern an interface, which is something that I made up about 30 minutes ago, but I think it's pretty true. Um, it, an important part of a design system, especially that I want to stress is this first part that is agreed upon. Um, so it's not, it's not just that a, a designer saunters in and bestows their design blessing on the product. Um, it's, it's that engineering and brand and design and marketing all come together and agree upon a set of principles and guidelines that, that constitute what our brands and products are and what they consist of. Um, so likely as neighbor grows, what would happen eventually is we would have a couple of collaborative stakeholders or maybe at some point even a team who governs the design system and they take input from all sorts of other teams and departments and they're they're kind of managing that ecosystem for right now it's me desperately trying to produce a lot of this while also supporting you guys and, and helping you um, keep moving um, so why why would a team spend all the time it takes to build a design system there are several reasons here are a few um, first and most importantly is uh, to create consistency across user experience and brand touch points. So as they move between desktop, Android, iOS, print material, advertising, whatever it is, we want them to feel like it's uniquely neighbor and, and that, that our brand still resonates with them and that they can use it in one platform or another um, and, and that it feels polished and that it's high quality. Um, it requires less debate per project because we're not deciding what our favorite color red is at the time. We've all decided what our color red is and we just use that. Same goes for buttons and inputs and all of those things as well. Um, centralized updating, which is my personal favorite because if we um, have a centralized source of truth and source of components or color or icons or whatever it may be, then we can update it in one place, propagate it throughout the site or throughout the apps and, um, and improve an experience really easily that way. Um, and it does allow for faster development because you can just drop in the button component rather than having to recreate a button each time, which has some upfront costs, um, which currently Jaden is eating some of that by moving things into Storybook. Um, but it's still, it'll give us faster downstream implementation because we'll all have high visibility into those components and a better understanding of how to reuse them. Um, so I want to jump into actually the, like how we create one of those and the different pieces that I'm trying to start out with here at Neighbor. Before I do that, does anybody have any just high level questions about design systems? No dumb questions, um, any thoughts or concerns or ideas about design systems? Cool. Actually, I have a question. Let's do it. Um, uh, how often would you expect the design system to undergo a serious change? Or is it like we make it once and then it's just iterations from then on to eternity? The second one is kind of the idea. But I would, I would expect a design system to go through a significant change probably as often as like a brand goes through a significant change. So if a brand shifts their color palette or their typography or something like that, then I would expect a design system to kind of do the same and react. So 
Um, I wouldn't expect a huge shift except maybe on a less than annual basis, maybe even less frequently than that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, good question. But it should be easy to do if you built it the right way. Roy once spent a really long time changing all of our blue hex colors at Lucid. Um, it was just like a whole sprint of Roy finding hex codes and replacing them with less variables instead of hex codes. And uh, it shouldn't, that shouldn't be the case. You shouldn't lose an entire developer sprint to color replacements if, if we do things right. Um, so Roy can be an advocate for that. So how do you go about making a design system? This is a picture of a little workbook that I used at, um, I taught a workshop last fall called How to Build a Design System in Three Months. And it outlines a framework of um, how you audit your product, how you organize and classify the, the pieces of your product, and then how you produce a system from it. So I'll be using some of, some of those ideas to help neighbor kind of craft their next generation of, of UI kit and design system. But I want to highlight, and that's, that's on my desk, by the way, if you want to look through it because you're excited about design systems. Um, but uh, I want to highlight a few of the most important parts and the ones that are actively in development right now that we're working on. Um, just to talk about why they're important and kind of how we can use them. Has anybody heard of this atomic design model by a designer named Brad Frost? Yes, Jaden has. Um, uh, the atomic design model essentially kind of prescribes that there are different levels of components that compose a, a product or an experience. So if you think of pages being a screen in an app or a page on the web, then you break that down into templates that are kind of generic vanilla pages that we can build on top of, organisms that are larger chunks of UI, molecules that might be um, something like a button paired with something else that composed of a few atoms, and then an atom um, is, is like the most basic unit of a design, like a piece of text. Um, and so you can move up and down this scale and you want to have consistency up and down the scale. And right now, um, what we want to get right is our atoms. We want to make sure that we have a really strong foundation to build on top of, and then we'll build upwards on this ladder. Um, so I, I like to think of those atoms as these as, as uh, foundations, which is what the Atlassian design system calls them. Um, and here's some of the things that they've listed on their um, foundations page. Accessibility guidelines, color, illustrations, logos, grid, iconography, typography, and one that I would add to this is voice and tone guidelines, which kind of describe how we communicate with customers, our language, our personality, words to use and not to use, which is um, a conversation that Chris and Preston and I have been having about some ways to, to refresh our brand as well. Um, we don't have all these things and probably won't have all of these things for, for a good while, but there are some important pieces that we should have. Um, before I jump into those, any questions about these or kind of atoms or foundations um, based on what you see here? Um, I'll ask a question. Yep. Uh, accessibility doesn't seem like an atom to me. It seems like pretty abstract. Right, like a, um, it seems like something that you consider when you're making all of your other atoms. I guess what? Why do you think they added it in there? Yeah, it, they they actually added accessibility recently, um, so that's that's a new one that they added. And these these might even be a step lower than an atom, even because um, an atom. I think in Brad Frost's model, an atom is very much like a tangible piece of UI, and so principles are not atoms, right? So these these are even a little bit earlier than atoms, but certainly they govern the atoms themselves. Um, so yeah, accessibility is much more abstract. You could call it these kind of laws of the universe, if you will, if you really want to get into the atom, if you really want to embrace the atomic metaphor, um, like gravity might be a principle that governs those, but um, I think, uh, yeah, I think you're right. These are probably a step before atoms of that model. But interestingly enough, I think, I mean, the other ones I could see as being physical representations, but I'm, I'm guessing if they added it recently, it's because they want to embed accessibility as a key principle yeah. for them, yeah. right? Because that's becoming a very important thing mm -hmm. across, yep. across the web. Right? Um, if any of you are accessibility advocates, which you all should be, or, or just interested in accessibility, I've, I've also been on our color palette running contrast checkers so that we can tell like how high or low contrast our color pairings need to be and make sure that low visibility users can read them and stuff. Yeah. 
Um, I guess along the lines of accessibility, would you put like localization in that bucket, or would it be its own kind of thing, or is it more high level than all of these things? Like, um, yeah, at Lucid we kind of treated localization at this level. Um, I don't, I don't know if I have a a great sense of a better place to put it, but yeah, it's, it's probably at this level, right? Because localization. Um, that's not really design, I guess. No, I, I think it is. Localization impacts a lot of things, but it definitely impacts design. Um, it certainly impacts the way you construct certain things or the way you design certain things, especially if you're doing right to left languages um, and you're dealing with overflow text and things like that. If you're also dealing with color theory and how colors are perceived in different nations, if you're, uh, there, are, there are lots of different ways it can impact it. So um, yeah, that probably would fit here more of the earlier kind of principle level of the design system question though. Um, so I'm currently working through a color palette. We're trying to get this implemented into Storybook, at least for web front end. Um, I've been talking to some of you about this as well. The idea behind a unified color palette like this is that we no longer reference colors by their hex code or by their raw RGB values, but that we reference them by a variable name. And by doing that, um, if someone ever comes along and says, Taylor, I hate that red, how could you ever propose that red? Here's the new red we should use. Then we can update that color scale top to bottom, red zero to 100, and it can propagate throughout the site. And we don't have to go hunting for all the hex codes like Roy did, um, but instead we can just update that variable across our experiences and apps um, and fix it that way. Um, and then it also gives us a centralized way to oversee all of our colors in case we do want to shift things for accessibility or colorblind purposes or things like that. Um, and so again, to ease your mind, we will not put all of these colors into the product. There's a high probability that we won't use purple and pink at all. Um, I know that the darker yellow colors look terrible because dark yellow is the hardest color to use at all. Um, uh, but this is uh, this is a good kind of starting foundation for what for what a future um, color palette might look like. Any thoughts or questions about colors? Uh, just a quick question. I see a little logo, like lock logo, uh -huh. on certain colors, probably one per uh, line. Yeah. Is there any specific reason for that? Um, yeah, I can I can show you where that comes from. Um, so when I am working on the color palettes. Um, I'm using a tool called Colorbox. Um, and let's pick a nice one, let's pick the green. Um, that was made by the, the design team at Lyft. And it actually uses like sign curves um, to, to help you find a good spectrum of colors. And the lock is where I threw in our brand color. So this is our brand like minty green color. Mm -hmm. And I threw it in there and so it's pivoting all of the colors off of that one so that I can make sure it's in the band as I'm, as I'm looking at colors. Um, and so that's what the lock means. So if you see the lock, that probably means it's like the primary color that I built it off of, which you can see the primaries over here. Um, so I'm using that as a base and then I'm trying to take it light and dark in two different directions. Thanks. Yep. Any other thoughts or questions about colors? Cool. Um, similar thing with icons, right? I'm, I'm trying to get all of our icons to where they're on the same grid, they use the same stroke, they have the same kind of detailing and texture and, um, and principled design. Um, the idea behind this is that hopefully we eventually get to a point where you say, I'm using the calendar check circle icon and you're not embedding the SVG or, or whatever vector format of your choice, PDF or whatever, um, into, the, into the experience. Uh, and that we can also centralize all of those and update them from a central point. That gets a little bit trickier across platforms and with different formats, but um, there are reasonable steps we can take to ensure some more consistency. Uh, just a quick question here. Uh, I'm not sure how padding works with the icon thing, because here there are certain icons which does not have any padding, like for example, list, the second icon. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't see padding there, but if I look at the plus icon, some, some padding is there. So is there any specific reason like when to use padding and when not to? Um, yeah, so there's, it's a bit of an optical game um, because like squares will always appear bigger than circles. And so you'd have to exaggerate the circle a little bit to make it match the square and things like that. Um, there are also some icons that are just more dense, kind of like that one. That one's probably the 
biggest exception here of the group. Most of them have some amount of padding. Um, but it's a combination of, if I were to zoom in on the little blue grid, you'd actually see there are three tiers of blue, where I have a main body, kind of a secondary body, and then the whole view box itself. Um, and so I try and use those as guides when designing. Um, and then also I will frequently just line up a random set of icons and just kind of optically make sure they look like they're the same weight. And so it's like a little bit of science and a little bit of intuition to just kind of try and get them to look optically the same. Um, that one, it just requires so much detail to get three in there. That's a little tricky to, to make it any smaller, but that might be one that we end up updating. So good eye. Where are these icons coming from? Uh, I just made all these for the hackathon. Um, but they're, they're all just like tweaks on icons that we have in the product, just to all kind of look similar. And what's the three of columns? Uh, just me putting them in a grid. They don't, they don't oh, 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 these three columns. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is a broken up layer where each part of the icon is still separate um, so that I can manipulate it and like mess with the Bezier curves and stuff like that. The second um, column is I flatten it, which means I vectorize the strokes so it's not using stroke data anymore. It's just using the math to, to say where the edges are. Um, I merge all the paths together so that it's just one piece and it can all be colorized at the same time. And then the third column is just taking that and bumping it down from a 32 pixel grid to a 24 pixel grid to make sure it renders nicely on low DPI screens and that it's like still legible and looks good and stuff. Cool. Um, and then uh, like uh, the biggest piece that, that you know, I, I hope to, to be able to get to here in the coming months is actually looking at all of our different components, all the different patterns and things that we use in the product and uh, defining a unified system for them based on sizing and color and state uh, to, so that we can reference components the same way we do colors or icons. And it's, it's all unified and there could be an input, but the input can have variations like with or without icon, icon left, icon right, um, which dovetails pretty strongly with some of the other UI kit things that are going on. Um, this is just a substantially larger effort that just takes time. Um, and also couples with the brand pretty strongly because we want this to feel like the brand. Um, with, the, with the end goal being that no matter how you interact with our brand and no matter kind of where the touch point is, it feels distinctly neighbor and it's recognizably neighbor. Um, Airbnb, who I know we talk about a lot, but they do a super good job of this. Um, every, no matter what experience you have with Airbnb, it feels like Airbnb. Um, and, and they have a lot of this centralized design system to help them do that. Um, so hopefully that's where, that's where we arrive. As we get a larger design team, it will become both easier and harder because we'll have several designers churning out design, but more people to focus on the design system. So um, it's just, just kind of a, a trade-off game there. Um, but that's an introduction to design systems. Um, any other thoughts or questions?